evening and welcome to the distinguished speaker series of the graduate school of business uh, first of all i'll just welcome you all and i'd like to thank our sponsors mazars and clifford decker and hofmeyer who make it possible for us to invite all those interesting people and today i have somebody here that is uh, <laughs> a very interesting person but that's extremely dear to me. I promise not to introduce him, it's not my role. But the history wants that we're both born and raised in Antwerp. We both went to the same university roughly at the same time. We rushed around to half the world in two different directions. We found each other back in Hout Bay. <laughs> this is a true story, I can't help it. A month ago, I moved out to Seapoint. But other than that, we're, we're still reasonably close. So I'm extremely happy that Gunter Pauli uh, was willing to give one of his very exciting talks about the themes that you all know he's interested in. But without further delay, I'd like to invite Cezanne to introduce formally Gunter. I would not be able to do it formally anyway, so I'll, I'll ask you two other people. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Suzanne Britton Renneker, and I'm one of the directors at uh, Cliff Decker Hofmeyer. I'm not going to do a song and dance, although my newly established neighbor has asked me to. Um, but I am going to introduce our guest speaker this evening. I've been asked to be brief, and I'll try to be brief. <laughs> I could introduce you in three words, <laughs> but uh, I think you deserve so much more. So our speaker this evening is Professor Dr. Gunter Pauli, and once again, welcome and thank you for being with us this evening. He graduated in 1979, a great year, the year I was born actually, <laughs> wonderful year. He decided after reading the first report to the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth, that he would help create innovative business, business models that transform society. He went on to create 12 companies in 12 years. An outstanding achievement in my view. Two of them, that he points out to me, have failed. But I think within that, there are many lessons and that we can all learn from today. Some of these companies included construction as well as the first ecological factory. However, when he realized that his successful green business model relied on palm oil, which destroyed rainforests and habitats, and habitats of orangutan, he set out to design a new economic business model that is competitive and goes beyond global, uh, globalization. Now, almost 20 years later, if not more, his organization is based on local resources, is competitive and on the rise. And I'm really hoping that you'll share with us the rise this evening and not so much of uh, all the competitive businesses out there trying to steal your ideas. He's published over 19 books, and the latest of them being The Blue Economy. It has sold over 38, it's, it's sold over 38, is it? Million copies, over 1 million copies in 38 languages. He's also the father of five gorgeous children, resides in Japan, according to my notes, <laughs> but we'll call you a Capetonian for tonight, and uh, because he's based in South Africa. So thank you very much for joining us this evening, and I hand over to Dr. Professor Pauli. Thank you. I think this should work, no? Is this working? Yeah. Yes? Great. So I have at least one hand free. And this paper I just stole from you. That's yours. I left yesterday Antwerp, our hometown. Um, and I have to be on Saturday in China, so I'm a little bit unbound because I accepted the invitation and I don't like uh, cancellations. So here I am, I did do a little detour, and I must admit I have again added to, to the carbon emissions uh, cycles. Beyond reason. But um, now, you know, now you know already why I put the beautiful orangutan there. I mean, he would like to change the rules of the game. The orangutan is the one who would love to change the rules of the game because the way we're playing with biology and biological soaps today is to detriment of the orangutan. And therefore, my whole logic is that we have to change the rules of the game, but the rules of the game for me is the way we play business. Business has been for more than 50 years brainwashed in the logic of Harvard Business School. And I must very openly admit that very seldom I get an invitation from a graduate business school. 
because I tend to have very critical words of MBAs. I have an MBA myself, so I know what is wrong with it, because I've done it. Um, I did mine in INSEAD in Fontainebleau. And also there, even though I'm the most accomplished uh, author um, of uh, all the graduates of MBA, they've never invited me. And I think they have a reason, because uh, it's not sometimes comfortable what I have to say. This to me is the most important image of what I try to achieve this evening. This glass is always full with water and air. Don't ask any other questions anymore. I mean, don't get into this uh, very funny, traditional question, is it half full or half empty? No, it's full. <laughs> and unless we are prepared to think out of the box and realize it's full, we're going to get stuck debating what is of no use. And unfortunately, that's what our societies are stuck with. We're debating things which are of no use. We're analyzing what is of no use. We need to go beyond what we know today. And therefore, I'm asking, when you're in business, do you do a SWOTS analysis? I mean, the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Well, this is Mr. Shoichiro Honda. And I had a great privilege in 1980 to work three months in his office. And in these three months in the office of Mr. Honda, you can imagine I didn't have full-time attention from him. But when I had a few minutes, I could ask my real dumb MBA questions and check it out with him. And I asked Mr. Honda one day, did you do a SWOTS analysis when you shifted from motorbikes to cars? And he said, of course not. He said, why didn't you do that? He said, if I would have done it, I would have felt very frustrated. I said, but what did you do? He said, I just made a list of all the weaknesses of my competitors and I felt great. <laughs> and it is something that stayed with me very clearly is that if you are an innovator, you are a change agent, you're going against the Goliaths of the world. The first important thing you have is clear in your mind. You feel good, you're going to make it. And if you have an analytical framework that makes you feel lousy, don't use it. And therefore, the SWOTS analysis was for once and for all eliminated from my logic. I never used it. And I think this is a very important lesson that I learned, particularly when I created this little company in Belgium called Ecover. Ecover. Somehow, in 1990, I got on the board of this little company. I was struggling on the market, but had succeeded already to get into a few international markets by selling a biodegradable soap. And I thought this was going to be the message. So I was invited actually by the owners to take over the company because there was an awful lot of capital needed in order to keep on supporting its growth. And therefore I decided that the budget for two years of what the traditional business model prescribes according to the MBAs for fast-moving consumer goods, that budget I reserved for building this factory. So you're looking at two years of advertising in one building on the base of my sales at the time. The result, though, was that we had CNN primetime news and many other famous TV stations. We were on 60 Minutes in the United States on ABC. We had Peter Jennings over. You named them. They all came and they all celebrated this. And before I knew, I had a problem with working capital because it was growing way too fast. And you know, the nicest problem you have as an entrepreneur is that you're growing too fast. But the banks don't like it. I went to my buyers' supermarkets and I told them they had to pay me two months cash in advance. And if you go through any of the textbooks related to supermarkets and there's an entrepreneur who tells you I want two months cash in advance and you only buy direct from me without an intermediaries and only per container and I deliver it straight to you, then logic tells you you're bankrupt. Unless you just smile and say, I'm the only one who has an ecological factory. And you can have all your customers come to my factory and plant a flower on the roof. And I only needed one to agree to the two months cash in advance, and the others all followed. 
and we succeeded. We grew from what is today 3 million euros to 60 million euros in two and a half years. It's unprecedented. No one has seen that before. And I didn't spend any money on advertising. That was the amazing thing. I didn't believe we should brainwash the women to make them think that they can wash whiter than white. <laughs> I thought they long figured out that it's not true. Still it works. But then this was the shock. And I insist in every lecture that I do for the rest of my life I'm going to tell the shock. Because I went to Kalimantan because not only is working capital a problem, supply chain is a problem. When you're growing that fast, you need to secure your supply chain. And so I went to Kalimantan, to Indonesia, in order to secure, and I got red carpet treatment until I got into the forest and realized what I was doing. I could not imagine that I was the guy cleaning up the rivers in Europe, the guru with the green factory, but I was destroying the rainforests. I was destroying the habitat orangutan. And at that moment, there's only one thing you've got to realize. Yes, you've got to buy a degradable product. It's not sustainable at all. And it's ethics that makes the difference between you and the next moment. It's ethics. Unfortunately, when people get used to a 55 net margin, they prefer to drop the ethics. Because that's what we would like to do, is we would like to do less bad. We will solve it. We will not destroy as much. We will look in with our research department for solutions. And we know we're not going to find solutions. Because once we are stuck with that cash flow getting into our veins, we don't want to drop cash flow. Once you're celebrated as the person who has gained 3% market share against Procter & Gamble, Henkel & Unilever, and you know you're now a Harvard business case that everyone can learn from, most of the people say no because they've lost the ethics. If you do less bad, you're doing bad. If you're stealing less, you're stealing. You have to switch to doing more good. And my partner, 50%, didn't want to follow. And if you're 50-50, you're stuck. You both agree or one opts out. So I donated him my 50%. Take it. I'm moving on in life. It's not the only thing I will do in my life. Because what we need to know is that business finally has to take ethics and values at the core of the business. It can't be decided by cash flow only. Cash flow is an ingredient, but not the only one. And my inspiration is the children, because I believe that we have to look at the reality particularly when you're small, family-owned businesses, mid-sized corporations, we have to look at the reality through the eyes of our children. Because when we're making decisions and asking ourselves, how will my son think about me in 20 years when I did go for the 55% margin for the next 20 years and become filthy rich? Or if I am going to say, enough, how much is enough? I have enough. And therefore, opt out and do better. Unfortunately, business today is not very often even considering these questions, just moving on. But my children are an inspiration, and these, this little story some of you may know, but there's my daughter Chido. She's from Zimbabwe. Chido learned how to farm mushrooms when she was 11 years old. And Chido goes for a walk in the fine boss with Philip Emanuel my son, and they find a mushroom, and she says it's an edible one. They pick it up, they take a piece out of it, they put it into a wet newspaper. The wet newspaper goes under the bed. Two weeks later, the molds are growing. When the molds start growing, there is a little plastic bag with coffee waste in it, and then part of the newspaper with the molds goes into the newspaper with the, in the bag. They close the bag, and two weeks later, he's harvesting mushrooms. Don't tell this young man at the age of three that there is hunger in the world. He says he can fix it in a month's time. He says he'll fix it in a month's time. He knows what is a month because it's exactly the time he needs between getting the wild mushroom and getting the first harvest. Now, that's the kind of level of changing the rules of the game that we need. Because we have to change the rules of the game. We can't play with the rules that we've known 
And look at him as a little bag. This is in our basement in Hao Bay. He's farming mushrooms. I know how to change the rules of the game. This is where I started in 1984. 1984. It's now 29 years ago. What you're seeing here is a savanna. The green patch is a savanna. Destruction of the rainforest more than 200 years ago by the Spanish to introduce cattle farming. Those little strings here is what is called Bosques de Galeria. They are just the strings of forests along the rivers. They've survived. That's where biodiversity was able to hang on to. And in the middle you see this big green patch. And that green patch is regenerated rainforest. When in 1984 Paolo Lugari and I proposed to regenerate rainforest, we were told that we realize you are not scientists. Because we scientists, we know that it doesn't work. We know that you have a pH of 4, that you can't grow, regrow a rainforest. You have no topsoil. You have nothing. Well, to my great regret, I have invited many of these scientists to come and see it, and they haven't come yet. It's a pity. But we do need to challenge science. I'm going beyond it. I very often say the scientists who now tell me that this can't be done, I tell them their diplomas have just expired. Because the last thing we need in a society where we're in desperate need to change the rules of the game is someone says it can't be done. Because I know the science. That is not ethical behavior. And I think we're in desperate need of people who are prepared to go beyond the science. And this was, is what made it work because it's mycorrhizal fungi. Now today you find in scientific literature quite a bit about mycorrhizal fungi having a symbiotic relationship. But we put it to a level, not only that we have this, but that we have the most efficient resin tapping of trees in Latin America. And the resins are all processed locally in this factory, and we're even producing our own biofuels. We don't believe in a lot of the biofuel jazz that is going around. We believe in what we have done. And because with, a, with an $8.8 .8 million investment, we're able to supply today biofuels extracted from the tree. It basically is turpentine purified to 10 micron. If you want more technical details, I can give. But we're processing it ourselves. We call it biodiesel because if we tell them it's turpentine, people say it can't be done. <laughs> so we just call it biodiesel so they don't debate it anymore. We're able to supply 10,000 people with the biofuels locally by regenerating a forest. And that forest is providing us drinking water. We have so much drinking water today in an area where 70% of the people before were suffering from gastrointestinal diseases that we don't need hospitals anymore today because there is healthy water. We had to close down the hospital for lack of patients. I mean, it's a nice problem to have. So as a result, the hospital is converted into a water production center. And we're exporting the water to Bogota. And by having people in Bogota, Colombia, pay the same price that they pay for Fiji water, Pellegrino and Evian, we are able to pay for 10,000 people water for free. I'm not against free markets. I'm in favor of using the market for getting social, economic development, responding to basic people needs. And water is number one. You don't have drinking water for the people, you don't have a community, you don't have a society. But I do know that between the date that we planted this and the date that we had biodiversity come back, the fauna and the flora, we have now more than 250 species in this area, it took us 25 years. And I do realize that a mother who has kids who are hungry doesn't have 25 years. We have to shift gears. We have to shift gears in our logic and get results quickly. And that means we've got to be inspired by people who've made a difference. And to me, there are two types of inspirations. One is nature, because nature is amazing. Nature is capable of resolving just about every single problem we have invented. But second, there are people who've done amazing things. Does any one of you know this lady? The Italian lady, Katia Bastioli. 
Who knows Katia Bastioli? Raimondos, you're Italians. John and Frank Raimondo, come on, you just had a great holiday in Italy, right? Katia Bastioli is the one who, in 24 years ago, was the first one to see how chemical industry and farming had to come back together. That was Feruzzi and Monterison. Both have gone through the gobbling up of globalization. And when they were being gobbled up by larger entities, they said, oh, but the work of Katia on bioplastics, bioelastomers, uh, bioherbicides, and all of that is of no use anymore. We're sticking to the petroleum. And Katia said, no. And she did something that no one had wanted to do. She said, I'm doing a management buyout of the laboratory. And I said, <laughs> really? <laughs> and so she got it. Today, she has more than a thousand patents. And she's the world's market leader in bioplastics solely from agricultural wastes, not from GMO like others do. Solely from agricultural waste. Now, you want to have a solution for some of your farm issues in South Africa? Make plastics and elastomers and herbicides and all of that out of your agricultural waste, which you can't blow back into the soil. Just like it's being done in pharma cooperatives in Italy. The hybrid of a for-profit company with 50% cooperative, hundreds or even thousands of farmers coming together, that changes the business model. And I think that's what we need. We need to change the business models. But we also need teams. And if I say we, sometimes I'm being asked, and who is we? Well, we sometimes is the polite form of I. That happens <laughs> sometimes. Um, we is a network of about 3,000 scientists that uh, I've been able to gather over the years. And the we is these people, the teams, the people who are focused on implementation. I must confess to all of you, I am obsessed with implementation. We are dying from the sickness which I call analysis. So what is my role? My role is, first of all, in these 187 projects we have today, sometimes I lead, but very seldom. Always I like to be a member of the team. But most important, I'm an apprentice. I learn. There's nothing more important. I'm a professor at three universities. And there's nothing more important than I keep in my mind that I want to learn from my students. I'm not teaching students. I need to learn. And therefore, my exam has been very much criticized around the world, well, particularly by the senates of the universities where I teach, because my exams are always limited to three questions. Three questions the students ask me. I don't ask any questions. This is boring. You get answers you already know. I mean, who wants to sit there for weeks listening to students who tell you what you know? So I wanted to figure out what I don't know. And so my students come to me, and they have now a special website where they verify what Pauli knows. And then they come. And fortunately for me, when I'm teaching in Mexico, or I'm teaching in Hungary, or I'm teaching in Turin, every exam series, there are one or two smart guys and ladies who have questions for me, and I have no answer. And when they have a question to which I have no answer, 20, 20, maximum. I've learned something. I want to know these persons, so I have a very good relationship with them afterwards. Apprentice. We are apprentices in life, and what I've done in my book, The Blue Economy, and I'm sorry, it's sometimes tough to get it. Um, uh, we're always running behind sales. We're indeed, yes, 1.2 million copies sold now, and uh, it's, it's growing. I'm off to the sixth Chinese edition and the first Russian edition in the next few weeks. It is just calling for attention. Why? I think it's calling for attention because we're talking about innovations that within 10 years generate jobs. We had an audit in, uh, done in April this year. We're at 3 million jobs after three years. We're far from the 100 million. But I believe the focus has to be the jobs, and that's why Honorable Mayor of Stellenbosch, who is here, jobs is the key, sir. And I agree with your, your, uh, you know, your urge to work on that. But what I have learned over the years as well is that the green economy is not going to give us the answer. 
We need another economy. Now, if you don't like blue because it has some political implications, change the color. I am not married to the color. It is not important to me. The action is important. We have to be innovative by generating more value. We have to stop trying to globalize by cutting costs. We're obsessed by cutting costs. We don't generate more value. And as long as we're in the mode of cutting costs, I tell you, China, India, Brazil, not South Africa, will win. And maybe the Americans, because they never play according to the rules of the game. Americans are the greatest cheaters on the rules. No one gives more subsidies, even more subsidies than the Europeans do, to agriculture. But that requires vision. And vision can only be created when you have a source, which I call fantasy. We need to think beyond what is real, what is realistic, what is acceptable, what is scientifically proven. But we need to translate into a reality by using science and teach people again to have a sense of risk. Risk is key. If you're not prepared to risk, then we can't change. This is the man who introduced me to this incredible story of the mushrooms. Xu Ting Chang, Dean of the Faculty of Biology at the Chinese University in Hong Kong. And he said, Gunter, it's 92, China will have a big problem. We're going to start drinking coffee. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to have a lot of coffee waste. Yeah. But he said, I figured it out. We're going to grow shiitake mushrooms on it. <laughs> he told me that in 92, and I said, how far are you down the road? He said, I've tested it. It works. So, he taught Carmenza Jaramillo, who was the, the chief scientist for the Federation of Coffee Farms in Colombia. He taught my daughter, Chido, and here is Chido going into the farms in Chipinge, Zimbabwe. I don't know how many of you have been to Chipinge, but it used to be the top coffee, like Blue Mountain Coffee from Jamaica today. That's what Chipinge used to be 20 years ago. She goes there, she teaches the women how to use the waste from the farm, the husks particularly, and how it can be used because it's fermented straight into, coffee, into mushroom farming. You know, the beauty is in Africa, when you come with a solution to a village and you tell them that you can farm mushrooms on this waste and your boss doesn't want it, but you can do it in an hour, two hours a day, the women get up, they sing and dance. You know what the University of Stellenbosch does? Anyone here from Stellenbosch? <laughs> they asked for a feasibility study. They want a technology audit. They want to verify if this is true. And I'm saying, why don't you just save the money, just go to Chipinga and see it. Talk to women who can't read and write and are doing it. And then figure out for yourself if you still want to spend the money on the study. We are over-studying, over-analyzing, over, over all the time. The people who are hungry want food now. The people who have no jobs want jobs now. And the only thing we need to do is do it. Because we've done it so many times. But this is in Paris. This is uh, two kilometers from uh, the famous Café Les Deux Magots. I'm sure some of you have been there. Two kilometers from Café de, Les Deux Magots. There is a container. In the container, we receive the waste of the coffee after you had the coffee. And there it is also inoculated in those plastic bags. And two weeks later, they're harvesting the mushrooms. And who buys the mushrooms? Café Les Deux Magots. 60 jobs, downtown Paris, 16 euro an hour is being paid. Why? Because we're able to offer mushrooms fresh in the Parisian market downtown without packaging without refrigeration, consumed within two, three hours after harvesting. At half the price, you can buy it from China. Nice. At half the price. I mean, we very seldom hear cases where people outcompete the Chinese. <laughs> half the price. And why are we doing it? Because we cut out everything that is in excess in this globalized market. We forget that the farmer gets 10%, and 90% is going to go to whom? Those who package, those who transport, those who freeze, and those who pump in the gases so that it still looks beautiful when it arrives, 
but it has no nutrition anymore. Look how it's growing. I mean, the intensity. You're looking at this container here, that's a 360,000 euro a year container. How many containers do you have that give you 365,000 euro? I mean, why, where were you waiting for? I mean, there's some attempts here and there, but people just don't say, let's go. Changing the rules of the game is first for me, stop analyzing, start doing. It's the most important. Because the market is there. People will buy. You have better food, you have cheaper food, you have high energy efficiency. Today we have more than 400 companies established around this, around the world. We increase purchase power. You know, the big challenge for South Africa is not give more wages. The big challenge for South Africa is to give people more purchasing power. Because you're importing too much stuff that is too expensive with its packaging. And you think it's cheap? It is not. We just may believe that it's cheap. And it only has just begun. Because we are now very much into the biochemistry of coffee. Maybe some of you know that if you have a strange odor in your refrigerator, you put in some coffee. You put in coffee grounds, the odor is gone. Well, we use exactly the same logic, and we're taking fibers from PET, PET, the bottles, and when you warm it up to 240 degrees, we put in coffee waste. That coffee, 10% mixture, allows you to absorb all odors. So, in conclusion, you drink it, you eat it, you wear it. What does it mean? It means that we have three cash flows from one product. But two of these cash flows were totally inexistent before. They weren't there. Now, did I do hocus pocus? I'm not David Copperfield. I'm not doing magic. I'm just using what's available, what is local. And I think this is really the shift in thinking that we require. Can we use what we have? Because 20 cups of coffee is one meter of textiles. South African textile industry has been eradicated. We can't compete, I'm hearing, against the Indians or the Bangladeshis. Well, yeah, but think beyond what you know. Look at the full cup with the water in the air. Don't analyze. Don't do this comparative analysis based on the water only. Imagine the air. And here are the shoes which have been launched by our dear friends from Timberland in the United States, 2013. It is called... Drink it, wear it. 20% of the soles is coffee. You take off your shoes, what's the nice thing? No smell. <laughs> you think this has a market? Of course it has a market. Today we have more than 100 clients. Our factory can't keep up. That's why I have to go to China. We can't keep up with demand. But South Africa is selling the PET bottles shredded for $150 a ton to China. We're using the PET bottles for $1,500 and we add coffee waste to it. Where are the entrepreneurs in the room? Are you going to scratch your head and say it was a nice talk? Or are you going to go to bed and can't sleep? I hope you can't sleep. Because, you know, we need to sense that the opportunities are omnipresent. And this is just of what I know, because this is the very big next step that we're taking. And this is the genius of uh, my dear friend Katia Bastioli. The company that she's leading is called Novamont. I'm chairman of the board. But that is what we have just taken over nine months ago. This is an old petrochemical plant that was constructed in the 1960s. And Libya was supplying cheap naphtha and petroleum. Friends. The friend is not there anymore. So as a result, the naphtha price is the world market price. This couldn't compete anymore. So we've converted the infrastructure of a petrochemical plant in the first biorefinery in history that is operating at large scale. But we need a feedstock. 
That's our feedstock. You know how it's called? Fistles. Cardoon. I know all around the world we do everything we can to kill it. I mean, again, we just see the water. We didn't see the air. This is the prime enemy of cities in Europe. They're spending millions of money on chemicals to kill it. The European Union has been funding farmers not to farm. Very strange kind of a, you know, kind of a strange attitude. But anyway, if you have no farming activity on 70,000 hectares, what do you get? Thistles. So we started harvesting the thistles. In, in only on the island of Sardinia, we're collecting 360,000 tons of thistles. That is enough for us to produce 350,000 tons of chemicals in a biorefinery. South Africa, if you believe in agriculture, South Africa should be in biochemistry. But the biochemistry, they don't teach at your universities. This is the advantage for the entrepreneur. It means you don't have to, have to, to hear that can't be done. Today, out of thistles, we produce plastics, lubricants, herbicides, elastomeres. Any of you is in the chemical business? You know elastomeres is high margin business. This is where you make the money. Herbicides, you make the money. We make pelargonic acids straight from the plant without any synthesis required. If you're a chemist, you know what we're talking about. Pelagonic acid is not what we usually can do. It's very expensive. As a result, we've taken over the Italian market of pelagonic acids. All cities in Italy are going organic in their fight against the thistles. Imagine a petrochemical plant, as you saw, that is normally pr pr processing 2.5 million tons of naphtha into 700,000 tons of chemicals. We're processing 350,000 tons of biomass in 350,000 tons. And whatever we have as waste is for whom? It's feed for the animals. Substitute soy that's imported. I'm sick and tired of genetically modified soy being imported to feed our animals. I know it's great business for Cargill. I don't think it is giving cash flow to the farmers. And I think this is one of the reasons why we see that we can generate an income for the farmers and we can clean up what is there. We have a portfolio of eight products today and we just found number nine because the thistles have an enzyme on the flour which is great for making the cheeses. None of these cheeses could be made anymore because we never had the harvesting of the thistles anymore because they were sprayed all the time with chemicals. And it only has just begun. Paper. Where are we? This is in South Africa. This is a picture I took two and a half months ago. This is in the Vals. This is where we're on strike today. Or yesterday. What are you looking at? Tailing dams. This is the crushed stones that create the asthma problems for the kids. And we know it. It's going to be your legacy for centuries to come. What do we do with this? Well, we turn into stone. I'm going to China because we're opening three factories in the next two months. Three factories. The first factory was done in Taiwan. We talked about it. I presented it at the Reserve Bank. People are still analyzing it. If this would be uh, an opportunity for South Africa. South Africa urgently needs additional revenue for its, for its miners. Urgently urgently needs to take care of the adverse effects of, let's call it, unintended consequences. As if you didn't know that when you crush gold and you have these fine dust, that when it's dry for a long period of time, that it just blows. And with all the cyanide and uranium that's still in there, you know you're jeopardizing the livelihoods of children for generations to come. You know it. So instead of castigating the companies for having done it, because they did with a license to operate, let's not forget they had a license to operate, let's clean it up. So we have, 14 months ago the first stone factory opened, 
We're opening this year three additional ones after one lecture of mine in Shanghai. One lecture, and the mining company said, is that true? Yes, it's true. Where can we see it? Taiwan. Oh, we'll go to Taiwan, there's no problem. Went to Taiwan, signed an agreement, they're building. Why? What's the cost of a tailing dam? How much is this in the balance sheet? Excuse me, there is a provision in the balance sheet for $240 million for one of the companies that I know would be an ideal solution for packaging, particularly fruits where you don't want any absorption. And playing cards, you don't want any absorption on your fingers either, otherwise you can't mix when you play poker. Magazines, magazines that have high quality pictures require actually a waxing. We don't need it anymore with stone paper. And you can write while you're in the rain. Actually, you can go diving, and while you're on the water, you can take your pencil and take note. It's embarrassing. It works. It did take 18 years to make it commercially viable, but today it's already in 40 countries. The market is so big, we can't keep up. And it only has just begun. What do you think this shoe is made of? Stones, yes, thank you. Stones, you're, you're getting used. Actually, this room is for lateral thinkers, you know, you see. <laughs> they have especially three rows, very long, so you can think laterally. Now, the picture doesn't show it very well, but you can see it's a bit dark on the inside. Why would that be? What do we put in the inside? Coffee, of course, yeah. For the macroeconomists in the room, it's something very important happening. You have cash that keeps on circulating in the local economy. It circulates faster with higher value added. What happens to the economy? It has no other option but to grow without exhausting resources. This is blue economy. We're not going to exhaust resources. But let me take about, talk about something that to me is a bit touchy. First the Spanish, then the Koreans, then the South Africans, overfishing. You are emptying your seas. I'm sorry, I'm not here to please you. I'm here to sometimes be, make you feel uncomfortable. But one of the biggest problems is that 70% of what is in your nets the nets of Secundjalo and the others. 70% of what's in the nets, we don't eat. We just want it. Unfortunately, we have nets that are so big that by the time we pull them in, the first 50% of the fish are pressed to death just by the sheer weight. And that's the reason why when the fishes finally get on the boat, they have to throw the fish on the ice because you're harvesting dead fish. I mean, I, I know they don't want to say it. They want you to believe it. It's fresh fish from the sea. Forget about it. These trailers with these long nets, they are killing the fish, and therefore they have to throw it on the ice. But it's worse, much worse. 25% of the female fishes that are being caught have eggs, and we kill them. Well, again, I want to go to the values and ethics. And whereas we all agree that if there were a farmer who had a cow that will bear a calf in one week's time and the farmer brings that cow to the butcher, sorry, to the, to the, um, to the abattoir, we will feel like, this is unacceptable. But we do it with fishes all the time. Worse, we love to eat the fishes, eggs. We eat the eggs. I mean, and then we're talking about Fishing is not very sustainable these days. We're eating too much fish. No, we're not eating too much fish. We're killing the fish with the eggs. One kilogram of a fish, female, has 3,000 eggs. Two kilograms has 12,000 eggs. And we kill them. And we say it's not sustainable. We've got to think about quotas. It's not quotas. 
It's our fishing techniques that are wrong. So we know how echographics work, right? When the lady is pregnant, we know that we have a very simple echographics to figure out. Now, funny enough, we don't use that for fishes. So I had to rethink with our team in France, and we realized that someone is very smart in catching fish. It's the whale. You know, whales, they use air bubbles. I mean, uh, granted, you know, they've been doing it for a million years. You know, we've only been fishing for 6,000 years, so we still use nets. We're still barbarians in the sea. Because, you know, with only 6,000 years of cultural experience of catching fish. The result, though, is that the whale is able to use bubbles to create an envelope around the fishes and brings them up to the surface and then just catches them. So we've designed new catamaran boats. The first ones will be delivered in March next year, 13 of them to Morocco, to Agadir. And what you see is a catamaran that will have the bubble system. The fishes come up, and then you scoop them into the sides of the catamaran where the water is at 4 degrees Celsius, not frozen. At 4 degrees Celsius, the fish hibernate. Then you let them run through a machine, and every female with eggs back to the sea. We run the experience uh, two years on the island of El Hierro in the Canary Islands in Spain. And in two years' time, we bring the fish stock back up to the level of 1950. Two years. Every fish you throw back in is 3,000 eggs, 12,000 eggs. I mean, we, we are forgetting that we, as human beings, have to change our rules of the game. We have impo imposed rules that are absolutely destructive, and we didn't know. As long as you don't know, you have unintended consequences. As soon as you know, you have collateral damage. That's not permitted under United Nations treaties, not even for the military. And as a result, everyone in this room is now party to collateral damage, <laughs> if you eat fish that way. Now, what is the beauty of it? If you don't pull the dragnets, and you don't need compressors to make the ice, you can run the boat on solar and on wind. You've cut 80% of the consumption. 250,000 tons of petroleum is eliminated because you don't drag the nets. And you don't make the ice. And the complete fish is processed on the boat. Yes, because once you have the boat and the machinery to check if there is a female with eggs, then you can as well process on the boat. And as a result, the most important cash flow is the omega-3. Whoever is taking omega-3 pills today, stop taking them. It's worthless. Why? Because omega-3 today is pressed out of a frozen fish. Now, omega is an oil. If you want to press an oil out of a frozen fish, I wish you good luck. <laughs> the only way we get it out is with steam and with acids. And that's exactly how omega-3 is processed worldwide today, with steam and with acids. Now, how many of you are going to the shop and say, I want olive oil that was steamed and extracted with acids? We all know that doesn't make any sense anymore because we all know it should be expressed, pressed out cold. Now, that's what we do on the boat. And what about the sardines? In fact, the coaches and the omega-3 coaches, what about those fish in the cans? Well, it is omega-3, but it doesn't work anymore. So you have the... You have a, a, a dead omega-3. It's just like the olive oil. If you have a steamed olive oil, it doesn't work anymore. It's olive oil, but it's not the same. So if you've lost 95% of the ingredient. But the most important is that the fishermen, in this model, generate five times more revenue. Five times more. Now, that's when the fishermen stop poaching abalone. You have to generate five times more than what they have. And if you don't do it, accept poaching for the rest of your life until all the abalone have been poached to death. So don't send out the police. Send out 
smart people get the boats in place and secure that the fishermen can double the number of jobs and can generate five times more revenues. It's the only solution. But you grow the economy with what is available. Not only that, you grow the economy by building up fish stocks, not eliminating fish stocks. And somehow we have put in our mind that this is not possible. If we want to eat more fish, then we're going to kill more fish. No, 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 no. Just use the regenerative power of nature. And nature will regenerate, provided we just don't kill the females with eggs. I'm going to talk to you about my latest initiative. Ever anyone has been to a little island called Bonaire? Do you know where Bonaire... You have been there. You must be Dutch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you get there? From here? No, from oh, from Holland. KLM flies non-stop, yeah. So, Bonaire is a small island. It's in the Gemeente van Nederland. It's a, it's a small community that belongs to the Dutch. And they have decided they want to be Dutch. Curaçao said, forget about you Dutchman. But they said we want to be there. Let me do you the advertising. It's nice. The seas are beautiful. But you get goats. And what's the problem with goats? 40,000 goats, 17,000 people. What do you think the goats will do? Eat everything. So there is a big debate amongst the ecologists. Two factions of ecologists. One says, got to get rid of the goats because biodiversity can't grow through anymore. And then you have the animal lovers who said, you're not going to kill the goats. You're not going to send the goats off the island. They've been here for 300 years, just like us. They have the same rights as we do. So... We've got to solve the problem. Is there enough food? The people have decided to import food. 99% of all food on the island is imported. What does it mean? Welcome to the world of obesity. Welcome to the world of diabetes. Welcome to the world of unhealthy food. And welcome to a world because my analysis, my hypothesis, is that when you have 50% of the food imported, then 50% of the population will always live in poverty. Because you drain cash for basic needs out of the economy. And you send it to America. That's what's happening most of the time. So, I look around and I say this. Anyone recognizes this? What's the red stuff? Well, in Dutch we call it zeekraal. No, it's not a little thorn. It's actually a, 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 a fatty plant, a greasy plant that has a, a natural osmosis of salt and it uh, extracts all the minerals from the seawater, but itself is not salty. Those who are a little bit more expert, Gracilaria, any one of you knows Gracilaria? So, that we find on the island and we say, have you seen this? And said, sure, we've seen this all our life. So, what do you do with this? I don't know, it's here. Do the goats eat it? I've never seen a goat eating it. <laughs> so, what did I do? I collected a kilogram, I crushed it, I put it in a bottle with a little bit of milk, and I said, give me a small goat. It's dumb. We have calculated on the island there is enough Gracilaria to feed 80,000 goats. The only problem is we didn't feed them. We don't see what we have. And that is, of course, the mangrove, because Gracilaria doesn't give the fibers. We know that goats need fibers for digestion. And therefore, we have embarked on a massive planting scheme for the mangroves, and we'll harvest the leaves and the leaves will give the fibers so the goats will have a balanced food. What do you think you can do with 40,000 goats that give you three liters of milk a day? Cheese. Cheese. What else? You can eat them as well. Yes, of course. Yeah, well, very well. What else can you make? Milk. What else can you do with the milk? Yes. Yeah, so 
Where do you make most money with when you have goat's milk? Clothing. Clothing? I haven't thought about that, actually. Thank you. Skin products. Skin products. Where do you make... I mean, it's so simple. It's sometimes embarrassing. Where do you make most money with? Ice cream. You know what the value is of milk in an ice cream? On a liter base? It's 25 euro. No wonder Unilever is in the ice cream business. You make money like you wouldn't believe. I didn't know so much money involved. Now, how many farmers do get 25 euros per liter of goat's milk? None. How many Unilevers are established in Bonaire? None. No competition. We have started producing ice cream. Change the economy. All those certs come, all have to eat. Ice cream made with milk goat, made with agave. Agave grows wild. Wild! Hey, gentlemen, ladies, wild! Why are you not only looking at this? Why do you say this is agave? Why don't you take it out? And then we put in some tamarind. And then you have a nice yellow ice cream. One scoop, two euro. We need to turn the economy around with things that can be implemented fast. Simple, clear, using what you have. And here you see the fields that... This is a project that we have done. This is Bonaire. This is Eritrea. We have created the largest fields of farming of Gracilaria on salt fields in Eritrea. And we're told on these fields nothing grows. If you say nothing grows, your diplomas have expired. It's over. We've got to think differently. So the goats are being harvested and here with all due respect uh, to our dear friend David, there's a great case here, I'm sure you all know. But now we have the goats, so of course we're going to slaughter them. 12,000 a year will be slaughtered. And only half of the goat is uh, edible in the form of sausages and hamburgers. We want to compete against the other hamburgers that are being imported frozen. But then there was this book published by Jason, your brother, David, and we're saying to them, haven't you read the book yet? And they're saying, no, we haven't read the book yet. Now, everyone kind of gets their stomach turning around when they see this and this. But the, productiv the productivity is too high. It is so high, it is so effective, that actually, again, we have a mindset of protein production, and we haven't just realized that the flies can do a better job than we ever thought. Last case, I launched it officially yesterday, but I think the world has waged coral wars. We have disrespected corals all around the world, also here in the Cape. Everywhere, you see these mountains of corals on the beach, you see completely destroyed in the water, and you see them in very unhealthy shapes. How come we keep on tolerating that? It looks like a war field. The humans then read these fantastic reports saying that apparently 85% of the corals in the world are under stress. Yeah, but I mean, every time we land somewhere with a boat, we throw out the anchor. And then we pull it in. I mean, we have a behavior that is clearly Neanderthal-like. It is definitely not sophisticated. So, We've created coral nurseries. Here you see them. They look like Christmas trees in the sea. And we do a very simple process. Any coral that is broken will pick it up and hang it up. And the coral within two and a half months will regain its fingers. That here is two and a half months. And here we have a coral. We break off the fingers. The fingers grow back. Corals are a symbol of the desire to live. They want to live. They have a capacity to live that goes beyond. Look at this here. One little piece of coral. This is six months time. You go from that little piece to this little piece. Now who likes to be there? Everyone else. 
elk horn. Elk horn coral. No, 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 no. The corals are not made of uh, fiber. They're not really made out of fibers. The corals have, uh, what's the? Calcium, uh, calcium carbonate. It really is an absorption. It's like your bones. That would be the right uh, comparison, right? Now, the beauty of it is that we do know that the acidification of the ocean is one of the worst results of climate change. And what we do is we describe the problem of acidification in the world, but when we do nothing, and we describe and we analyze what is happening. Look at the little forest we create. That is in two years' time. You go from a small coral to a big one, and look at this. We regenerate the forest. Somehow, we've been regenerating forests where? On land. Land is 30% of the earth. 70% is water, and we don't reforestate the water. Let's, let's look at the air that we don't see in the glass of water. And that is to me my main thing. South Africa has such huge opportunities, provided we see it. We have committed, just on Bonaire, to plant 100 million corals. It's a $500 million budget. And I launched it yesterday in Maastricht in the Netherlands. And King Willem-Alexander is going with me in November to plant. We need people who put on the shorts, get in the water. There's nothing better than the Dutch King to do it. I know all the Bonaireans want to see Maxima, you know, they don't want to see the King, you know, they don't want the Queen there, but you know, that, that I couldn't fix for them. A hundred million cores. Now imagine here in South Africa along the coasts you would need a hundred billion corals to be planted. The coral nurseries are fully funded. We can do it. It's a matter of deciding how to do it. Now what is to me the most important is we need to combine all of that. And I'm coming to a conclusion. We need to combine all of that. We need to combine the fishery with the corals. You can't separate them. They're all one. But in every single initiative that we have taken, and you have seen ten, of the 187, we know that there is a business that can stand behind it. But it's a different business model. The best we can realize in life, to me, is the joy of learning. I've tried to share with you this evening some of the things you could learn. Surprises. Things you didn't know of the bad things we're doing, some of the things we didn't know of the good we could do. We need to expose ourselves to the joy of learning. Here is me with my son. You know, in my house it's prohibited to use any batteries. Batteries are prohibited. So I need to teach my son how to play with a helicopter without a battery. That means he's exposed to the laws of physics instead. But if we only teach our children what we know, they can never do better than we have done. We must create a degree of freedom. And that's why I write fables. I write children's stories. Because I fail badly with uh, the people of my generation. Exceptions like Walter, of course, uh, are few. And Conrad, you know. But most of the time we fail because people say, it's not possible. It can't be done. It's never been done before. And I believe that we have to reach out to the next generation in a much more proactive way. I've committed to write 365 fables. I have today 125 ready. I want to reach 500 million children every day, worldwide. That's the same as Nestle does. I mean, if Nestle can do it, I can do it. But I have one little advantage. The Chinese government, the Communist Party, has approved all my fables for free distribution in China. 340 million kids. Nestle doesn't have that. <laughs> but why are the Chinese behind it? Because we're bringing projects. The Chinese, we can criticize them for so much. But they're logical people. 
passionate about things to get done. And the Chinese, when someone says, let's do it, they do it. We don't have to go through a lot of the politicking, a lot of the lobbying, a lot of the bureaucratizing. None of that is needed. And therefore, I believe that China is going to be a great partner, both in the education as well as in the implementation. Summarize, we have to use what we have. We have to think reindustrialization based on primary sectors. Primary is fisheries, is agriculture, is mining, is forestry. We need to rethink how we can use those four primary sectors to reindustrialize. And South Africa is ideally placed to lead in that. We have to innovate in the business models, in the business concepts, and outcompete to generate a better world. I think we're in this, I'm here to generate a better world. I don't know about you. Because I've realized that whatever I've earned here, I can't take with me afterwards. So we better work with what we have and enjoy it in the meantime. And close with the wisdom of Mandela saying it always seems impossible until it's done. We need to rethink again. What's impossible? Let's do it. Thank you. Good. Um, Gunther, thank you very much for this inspiring speech. And uh, I'm very happy, I'm very proud I'm the first business school that invited you. Uh, you might risk to be invited again. <laughs> we, we are reasonably aligned, so, so that's good. Uh, question time. Any questions? Yes. So, first of all, thank you very much for a very inspiring and it's who are very you? Innovative talk. Who are you? My name's Anthony Silverberg here. Sorry, I didn't. One, one, one problem that we have in this country, and you say we shouldn't look at problems, but how do we get people to work? Because we have all these ideas, and you say it's all about jobs. We start the industries, and next year everyone goes on strike. And you can have your small industry, and it'll still be swamped because the big unions will go on strike now. We've got 80,000 miners on strike. We can't get that industry to run. We've got the motor industry on strike. We've got the municipalities on strike. What innovative ideas have you got to inspire people to work? Not only the joy of learning, but the joy of working. Thank you. I don't know if I would have the joy of working when I'm getting 60 or 100 rand a day. I don't think I would have. And I think it's, uh, again, the whole problem of, in the world of globalization, industry, South African industry, like Belgian industry, like uh, many other industries around the world, we've been in the trap of having to cut costs. And the easiest one to cut for us has been labor. The easiest one. And therefore, since we're in the mind frame of having to cut costs, we've never been able to generate the value that it actually is in there. I mean... I'm having a meeting with, uh, with uh, several of the mining companies on the 13th of September, early in the morning at 7.30. I'll not disclose where, otherwise other people may show up. But we have a meeting and saying, I look at your industry and you could generate double the amount of jobs while you're earning triple. I see it. Now, are you willing to look at this? Or are you going to stick to your logic of cutting costs and getting always under the market price? <coughs> and if you keep your benchmark, this, the Australian mines at $680 a ton of costs of gold, of our, per ounce of gold, then you're going to have strikes forever. Because you're not generating enough value added and purchasing power to finally lift people out of poverty. We have to lift people out of poverty. We have to give a perspective. So people know they can do much better. But at this moment, I'm sorry to say, also the whole agricultural debate. I have been with the agricultural people in the Western Cape, the white people. And I said, we can double your revenue. But if you only want to do pears and apples, then there's nothing I can do. We have shown that with your fruits, you can get nine cash flows. 
Why do you stick to one? We had Jill Marcus when she was chair of APSA. She organized a meeting of all the nine guys together. And she knew the exposure they were having as a banker. And we said we can generate more revenue right here. Only one responded, Spears. No one else responded. So there is, there is a conservatism, particularly in the Stellenbosch area, that is not in line with what the country needs and what the opportunities are. And that is my challenge. And that's why I'm here to say to you, you've got great opportunities. And if the opportunities are on the table, I'm sure you can get everyone around the table. And I'm donating my time to make them available to you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Pascal, the surname is M-O-S-I-A, pronounced Musia, and I'm also the chairperson of Kayala Gunya Human Development. Now, Kayala Gunya Human Development is the abbreviation for Kayalicha, Langa, Google, and Yanga, and we deal with education, social development, health, arts, and culture. Now, these are 16 business lines, uh, so et cetera. We registered as a non-profit organization. Now, the question I would like to pose to you, sir, is, uh, doctor, is uh, the world of business is changing, and do I need a PhD, and do I need a PhD to change the business, the business world? Thank you so much. Do I need a PhD to change the world? Absolutely not. <coughs> Actually, my basic advice, I have a two-day course, which I do around the world, which the uh, title is, How to Create a Company Without Experience, Without Diplomas, and Without Money. We need to get out of this stupidity of the business plans that we have been imposed on us. I allow my student entrepreneurs only to write a business plan when the first invoice has been paid. <laughs> Not before. Because when the first invoice is paid, then you know what you're talking about. Otherwise, you're just doing mind exercises with Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> what happens if I put a 20 there? What happens if I put 40 there? You know, it doesn't make any sense. We have lost the capacity to learn about business by simply securing the most important act in business, sell. You need to have the capacity to come to a negotiated sales agreement. And that means someone pays you a price for your lemonade. And we don't do that with kids anymore. We don't permit them anymore. But we need to get back to the basics of the act of business is a sales agreement. And once you know how to do sale, then get down to the business plans. But not before. You really want a PhD in business? <laughs> well, why don't you do it then? If you really want it. Okay, well, I wish you good luck. You don't need it to work with me. <laughs> Doctor, uh, I, Nicholas Smallbig, Media Sensiari, I, I share some of your frustrations. Let me stand. It's, it's a bit rude. I share, I've just come back from, from Lusaka in Zambia, and uh, I'm a Cape Tonian. Um, so I've been around here for most of my life, all my life. And when I was in Lusaka, I was able to get an audience with um, aides to former presidents, heads of departments, ministers, former consuls, consuls, for two hours, four hours. I come back to Cape Town, and it takes me a week to get a meeting with a friend I've known for 15 years because they're busy. So I share your frustration about our, our, our level of commitment, our level of wanting to do things. Rather, uh, we, we need to overanalyze things. What can I do to help you? Simple. You, are, uh, you said he doesn't need a PhD. I have a law degree. What, what can I do to help you? To ease that frustration. Well, I have a happy frustration. I'm frustrated uh, because I think that we don't make enough use of the opportunities around. So my only way to get me happy is that you do something. Get going. I mean, I've given 10 cases. I can, you can go on my website. You can find 100 other ones. 
do something. Go and visit. Start a mushroom farm. I mean, I don't know if we need more flies, uh, David, but you know, hey, <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, we need, we really need to, us, to follow more our passion, our intuition, what we think is good, and I only subject all the decision making to one analysis. Am I securing multiple benefits or am I only pleasing me? And everything we do, in my view, has always have to have a contribution to more drinking water, more and better food, better housing, healthier housing, health, renewable energies, education, jobs, and please, ethics. The world lacks values in ethics because the egos have become so big that they're willing to go over whatever it is. For, thank you very much. For the sake of time, one last question. Is there, if you say it like that, nobody dares to ask that last question. Okay. There, there was a lady. Oh, then we take two ladies. I'll, I'll take two questions. Um, if you don't mind, I have been wanting to grow mushrooms from my coffee for years, but I've never known how. Um, so if you could please tell me just simply what I can do to do that. So why don't you come and meet my son? I would love to come and meet your son. Yeah, I mean, he can tell you. And, you know, it's, 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 you know one of the things with a lot of the a lot of these processes is that it's half science and half arts. It's not only the hard science. You need arts. You need to have, as the Germans say so beautifully, Fingerspitzengefühl. It just needs to be in the tip of your fingers. It needs to be working right. And I think sometimes we have to realize that you don't have it. And then you say, well, I'll do something else. Um, and I must say, Chido, my daughter, she just has an amazing Fingerspitzengefühl. I mean, she's never failed with one bag of mushrooms ever, whereas other people next to her fail. And, you know, we're, we're, why? Sometimes we don't know. But let's not forget that we're not the only sentient beings in this world. Plants and mushrooms are also sentient beings. And maybe they don't like being treated the way some were being treated. I've never tried it before. I was just wondering if you could tell me the steps. I, I, my, my, I just, I, it's not more than I told you before. Oh, so you just take a plastic bag, put coffee in it. But you have to first know a mushroom that is not toxic, okay? <laughs> That's step number one. I said you first find one that is not toxic. Second, you can take the hallucin genetic Plus ones as well, of course, but uh, I cannot do that with my son, so oh. that is your choice, okay? But you need to first start with a mushroom that works, and it works means it must come from your ecosystem. Okay. But did you know that Africa is the home of 25% of, of the world's biodiversity of mushrooms? And the only, the only spores, mycelium, that is available in nitrogen in South Africa is the white button mushroom coming from the Netherlands. South Africa has not embraced its own biodiversity in mushrooms. It doesn't. You can find now shiitakes and you can find some oyster mushrooms. They're non-native. So the first thing to me is discover the beauty of your own biodiversity. You have it. Your forests are rich and a wonderful... And that's where I say, go for a walk in the forest <coughs> first. Okay. Thank you. And find the right one. Last question then. Um, I'm referring back to the story about replanting of the corals. And I found that very interesting because from what you said, there wasn't a specifically economic advantage to it. It's very, from what I understood, it's just creating the health of the oceans again. Kind of restoring everything at the balance that, that um, corals bring to the oceans, I would imagine. I don't know enough about them, but I would imagine they affect the fish life and a whole lot of the ecosystem that they're based on. But what I'm interested about is you said it costs $500 million to plant 100 million coral stems, for want of a better word. And what, where does that kind of funding come from? Is that purely um, people that want to change 
the environments that wa that want to do good for the environment for the longer term impact, or is their commercial partner thinking bigger picture, thinking about the fishery, the fisheries of the future, and uh, I mean that kind of funding is, it's. Yes. It's not pocket change, and it's also not a lot of money, but for something that's purely environmental, I think that's quite a lot of money. There is always something that is very important. If you were first to raise the $500 million to do it, then you never get going. That's the big problem. So therefore, we did already 3,000. We get the tree nurseries going. We show them. These are the real trees. This is not Photoshop. Huh? This is a real tree. This is a real coral nursery. And so, what is the mechanism of getting going? People, and, and I didn't go into detail for the sake of time, but I'm happy to go into detail. People go and take an exam called PADI. Who is a PADI here? You know, you go PADI, you take an exercise, you know, you get your diploma, and what do you want to do? You want to go diving, right? If you, so, we're attaching with PADI an agreement that under certain circumstances you get your PADI, and you commit to one week, and every week you plan 250. That costs you $1,000 extra. Okay? $1,000 extra. How many people would like to go learn how to dive and then go for a week planting corals? I, I mean, I launched yesterday. I have 46 people already lined up for leaving in January. Because people think, I'm going to do paddy. And how much does a paddy uh, certification cost you today? $300, but you fly from Europe to the, some warm waters because you don't do it in your swimming pool, and so you pay at least another $1,000 or $1,500, so you add another 1000 I mean, this is, this is within reach of many people. But then your, your holiday gets a purpose. Now, what is the business model behind it? If you have planted with your family 5,000 corals, would you like to go back sometime? You definitely want to go back and see if this worked or not. So what do we have? Repeat business. So the business model is driven by a certification of diving with an additional cost in a purpose. And that is how we want for next year the first 1,000 people to plant. And they pay $5. But if you do 250, you get it for $4. You know, that's the way the market works. But you just get people to commit to plant a thousand per two fifty per week. Boom 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 boom. Right, so, so you've really driven the field impact so that making a different spectrum you're gonna go dive in any case that you can do good. I I mean I, I would like to call it more than feel good. I as an individual know I can make a difference. And it's very seldom you go on holidays you know you're gonna make a difference. Now if you do it on the hundred and forty eight diving points that they have there I mean, you very quickly can make a map. So we're creating in the center, in the city hall of Bonaire, we're creating the coral war room, where you see how the corals look like now, and you go all around the island, and you can start planting. But I wonder if you have any idea how many trees have been planted for the past 50 years by people who paid for the tree. Have any idea? Only three years ago, Prince uh, Albert from Monaco, he started with an initiative. They planted 17 billion trees in three years' time. 17 billion trees at an average cost of $6 a tree. Who had the budget? See, the world is so rich and we don't know it. The world has so much money and we don't use it. So when there was the opportunity for Prince Albert, to take that initiative, 17 billion, I mean, this is a 60, 70 billion dollar budget that was spent without having to create a fund and administrate it. And this is where leadership comes in. When there's a, see, we change as individuals because the doctor tells us we have cancer and therefore we stop smoking, then we change. Or because there's an obvious action that I can take that we know will make a difference. And that's what we need now more than ever in the world. Simple actions that make a clear difference tomorrow. And I can do it. And I don't need any intermediaries. And this is very important. We need, 
in the economy to disintermediate also when we want to be useful as citizens in this world. Thank you very much, Gunther. Can I invite Mike to say a few words of thank you? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Dr. Pauli, thank you very much for uh, coming to see us and uh, not deciding to miss your, miss your flight and to come and visit us. Amazing talk, I must admit. Really enjoyed it. I think extremely thought-provoking. Thought As an accountant, I suppose the old adage, analysis leads to paralysis, is quite apt. Uh, it's something that uh, <coughs> accountants are very good at. And another problem with us accountants is uh, we're also very good at cutting costs. So maybe uh, accountants need to just think a little bit and come and listen to you more often. But uh, I think one of the big important areas that you're focusing on is that we need entrepreneurs in this country. We need entrepreneurs that realize that the answer is right in front of us. It's right there. So thank you very much. And uh, really do uh, hope that your endeavors bear the fruit that you've been bearing in the past. And uh, on behalf of the Graduate School of Business, Cliff Decker, Hofmeyer, and Mazars, I'd just like to give you this gift as a token of our appreciation. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you all very much, Gunther. Thank you very much. You have the risk that I'm going to reinvite you. You know that. But I really appreciate that you have accepted the invitation. And you flew half around the world, which you're not going to do anymore, of course, with the CO2. Uh, nevertheless, to be present here. Thank you.